Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I feed off my good afternoons. Okay, before I present the 2015 I Do Snyder Book Award, Judith and I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank three incredible scholars who served on our 2015 I Do Snyder Scholarly Book Award Committee. They are Dr. Heidi J. Nast, who served as chair, and unfortunately she's not here, Dr. Karen Flint, and Dr. Funke Okomo. So you can, Okomi, stand up. And I'm sure that you all present join me in uh, sharing the Women's Caucus's heartfelt thanks for their service. Now, it's an absolute honor and privilege to present the 2015 I Do Snyder Book Scholarly Award to Dr. Abosede George of Barnard College for her 2014 Ohio University Press book, Making Modern Girls, A History of Girlhood, Labor, and social development in 20th century colonial Lagos. Here is what the awards committee had to say about George's book. Abosede George examines how European and African forces in colonial Lagos constructed girlhood in relation to girls' lives and labor, with the girl hawker as the work's primary focus. Innovatively intertwining accounts of elite Lagos women, mostly Yoruba, British welfare officials, and girl hawkers, George shows how girlhood was instrumentalized for different and often contradictory political purposes, namely racialized colonial development objectives on the one hand and local and elitist nationalist purposes purposes on the other. Her work calls for scholars to rethink and reimagine how girlhood has been central to colonialist and nationalist uh, projects. Her idea of the salvationist gaze suggests ways for reviewing how the figure of the poor African child continues to be instrumentalized locally and internationally in ways that ignore the agency of lives structurally impoverished. So ladies and gentlemen, Abosede George. Oh. Um, I just have a few words. I'll be very quick. I know we are short on time. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you um, to a few people who have uh, made this moment possible. Um, Margaret Snyder, one of the individuals that the book prize is named for, initiated the book prize, and Ama Ataidu, um, the other person that names this prize. The book prize committee, of course, thank you so much for your work. Um, Judith Van Allen, Nwando Achebe, my fellow prize winner, um, Emily Burrell, uh, Rachel Jean-Baptiste, Corey Decker, uh, Women's Caucus um, soldiers that also made this moment possible. Um, I definitely want to thank my dissertation advisor, um, Richard Roberts, who is all over the program this year, but he's also part of the making of this book. And um, uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Carolyn Brown, who was my mentor in undergrad. The first time I came to the ASA was as an undergraduate at Rutgers. They gave me a little fellowship to come, and I think that was the first time I came to Women's Caucus, so that was just a few years ago. 
Um, and it's such a thrill, it's such an incredible, unbelievable moment to be here at the podium at Women's Caucus receiving this incredible prize. Um, I wanted to thank some really key colleagues who are part of a writing group that made this book happen. Uh, Karina Ray, uh, Ben Talton, Toja Oko, who's in here with us today. Thank you guys for all your work. And of course, um, the editors of the new African history series, Jean Allman and Ice, um, Alan Isaacman, who agreed to take on this book and publish it and um, make it a reality in that physical way. Um, and of course, the publishing company, uh, Ohio University Press, and Jillian Berkowitz, um, who may or may not be here, and her staff for the heroic lengths they went to to make the book come out in a timely fashion. Um, for those of you who are uh, pre-tenure or tenure track, you know the importance of timely publications. <laughs> um, girlhood as a historical topic may seem like a, a bit of a head scratcher, and at various moments in the writing of this book. Um, even I would kind of lose track of what my inspiration was and kind of need to talk it out as we need to do sometimes. Um, the book started as a dissertation about social welfare reformers and um, we could think of them as uplift women in uh, colonial Lagos. But I think the book really found its soul, so to speak, when I switched the focus to girls that they were trying to uplift in girlhood itself. Uh, a very influential book in my thinking um, about why, why I was doing this was actually um, Ronke Oyeomi's Invention of Women. And that was actually very influential for me because of its argument about the salience of age difference versus um, gender difference in ordering social status in a Yoruba uh, worldview. Like many of us, it was, uh, I was enormously attracted to the analysis, which called us to look at the body, uh, the person, not for their most obvious physical features, but as bodies that hold time, that hold experience, and imagine a social system wherein that type of difference, the difference of time, or a generation might be more central. I'll be quick. Um, uh, when I first read that book, of course, I was much younger than I am now. And even though I'm attracted to um, the analysis, I started to think about, you know, if all systems, gender-based gender systems, race-based, class-based, or age-based are ultimately systems of power, how would thinking the world from the margins of such a system um, help us to see it differently? How would thinking about an age-based system or a generationally um, uh, hierarchized system um, help us to see it differently if we're looking at it from the perspective of, of girls? where we see intersecting gender and generational difference. So the book was very liberating for me, Invention of Woman, um, and it was also very provoking for me. So thanks um, Ronke Oyaomi for her work as well. It feels great to win this prize. It feels really great to be um, an author, a scholar, someone who's allowed to do scholarship, and to be in a place where your scholarship is valued and um, honored in these ways. Um, and I'm only mentioning this because um, right now, many of us are not in a position to focus on our scholarship, right? And the whole casualization of the faculty means that people are constantly working, there's no time to write. Um, when I came to the ASA as a teenager, and to the Women's Caucus as a Rutgers College student. This is the kind of academic community I saw, one that was interested in ideas, women's ideas, and honoring them, foregrounding them. And I think that we should, um, I would like to see this kind of community continue, expand, and grow stronger. So I suppose that's all I really want to say is that you know, we're in this phase of where the possibilities for someone like me, a uh, woman scholar, women of color scholar, are increasingly threatened by the casualization of this kind of work. So 
in our own ways, in our own institutions, um, I would ask us all to fight against uh, the casualization of academia. Thank you. Friends, thank you very, very much for the honor of being the person to speak at the 40th anniversary of our wonderful caucus of the ASA. And I would like to take a minute to ask all those who had something to do with the creation of the Women's Caucus just to raise their hands so we can all cheer you. <laughs> Where are you? And just, just so we know where we're going and that we have a future, I'd like to ask everyone who's under 35 years old, the youth, <laughs> to raise your hands and we'll celebrate the future of the ASA. Look at them. And all of us, uh, we can learn the details about the creation at the next panel discussion, I think, following yes. this one. So we all have to go there. But I want to especially thank for inviting me here, Judith and Rwanda and Alicia Decker and Claire Robinson, who had a lot to do with it. Thank you very much. My discussion this afternoon has three parts. First, where have we come from, the women's movement? On whose shoulders do we stand? Second, what brought us where we are today? What was the United Nations role, if any, in the birth and growth of the global women's movement during these four decisive decades? And third and finally, we face the future. Where do we see the movement going? Where do we want it to go? I will look through my own lens of experience working in Africa with African women since 1962, <laughs> with the United Nations starting in 1971, and now with two NGOs, the Greenbelt Movement of Kenya and uh, the Sir Leaf Market Women Fund of, Uganda, of Liberia. Okay, let's take our three questions. First, whose shoulders do we stand on? And how have we progressed since 1975? We women have come a very long way over these four decades. Our relationship with the UN has evolved from being seen just exclusively as mothers by UNICEF and as farmers' wives by the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. Today, we can act and be seen as professors, scientists, doctors, farmers. To understand whose shoulders we stand on, there's a very, this is a very quick review of history, very quick. Women have organized to support each other, as we know, throughout history. In villages across Africa, they planted and harvested together. In the colonial period, they protested the introduction of cash crops, unjust labor regulations, and men's sole entitlement to land. In the West, the International Council of Women promoted women's suffrage, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom lobbied for creation of the forerunner of the UN, the League of Nations, and for equal rights of men and women in that organization. Turning to the United Nations, there were only four women among the 160 delegates who signed the UN Charter in San Francisco in 1945. Yet those four women managed to insert equal rights of men and women 
in several places in the charter. They also insisted that civil society uh, be given a special relationship with the UN, and they got that. A year later, women delegates ensured that the Commission on the Status of Women, we call it CSW, should be independent and not just an appendage of the Human Rights Commission. As African and other colonized uh, countries gained their independence after World War II, the agenda to, they transformed the agenda to include not only legal issues, but development itself. Coming to the four decisive decades since 75, those of us who go back to the 70s have seen many changes to celebrate. Here are a few examples. There was very, very little national data on women in African countries in 1974, as we found out when I was working at ECA, and we were trying to put together the first region-wide database on women's situation. This year, the UN publication that just came out, The World's Women, Trends and Statistics, has extensive African data. There was just a scattering of women in sub-Saharan African parliaments in 1975. In fact, even in 1997, it shows about 8%. This year, women averaged 23%, and as we all know, Rwanda leads the entire world with nearly 64% women in its lower house. That's terrific. At UN headquarters in the early days, there was not one woman in a high policy level until Helvi Sipola of Finland was appointed and made an assistant secretary general in 72, heading up social development and women. By 2013, women have climbed to 42% of professionals at the UN headquarters, although they're still pretty heavy at the low end of the scale. Those recent examples of progress lead us to my second question. What caused that profound change, those profound changes? What was the United Nations role? I am convinced that one strong factor is the birth and growth of the global women's, in the birth and growth of the global women's movement is the International Women's Year held in 1975. The impetus for the year included publication of a path-breaking book that I'm sure everybody in this room has read, Women's Role in Economic Development, by the distinguished Danish, econ Danish economist Esther Bosrup. Its identification of women as farmers and entrepreneurs, in addition to their caregiving roles, brought joy to the women in the UN. Egypt's Ida Gindi grasped the opportunity to hold the first ever meeting on women in economic development in 1972. And against that background, the unprecedented idea of the whole world celebrating an international year for women and of holding an international conference to launch it was welcomed. Women were ready to heed the call of the UN. Kenya's delegate, Phoebe Asio, told me during the CSW session that she phoned Nairobi and said, we, our government should host the 1975 conference. Well, the, the result of the phone call disappointed her, but after all, Kenya got it 10 years later, at the end of the decade for women. The World Conference on the International Women's Year, Mexico City, June 1975, was an extraordinary event for its time. It brought out 5,000 participants. 
and the parallel unofficial NGO at Civil Society Conference hosted another 6,000. So many thousands of women and some men, scholars, activists, politicians, homemakers from 133 countries had never before met face to face. It is, is it a surprise that the delegates to the International Women's Year Conference, IWY, from so many countries didn't agree on everything? Any revolutionary movement needs to allow and even foster controversy. The roots of the major Mexico differences of view were these. In the North, women's lib, feminism called women's lib, had taken hold in a big way after women got the vote. In the global South, broader issues such as a new international economic order, the situation in the Middle East, and poverty prevailed. What impact would these ideological differences between women of the South and of the North have? In time, they would expand the women's agenda to embrace global political and economic issues. Thus, the Mexico Conference began to connect the women's agenda with the larger UN political agenda. Its visions of equality, development, and peace allowed this convergence. A global women's movement was given birth. The excitement experienced by the Mexico Conference participants in finding what united us propelled women to form new organizations to ensure a long life for the global movement that was emerging. Mexico became an inst inst institution building conference. At a businesswoman, oh wait, sorry, at a pre conference seminar, Esther Oklu, the feisty businesswoman who established the Federation of Ghana Industries and became its first president, responded to concerns about loan sharks about banks that wouldn't accept women's small savings or even give them any loans. I remember vividly how Esther raised her voice to state, and she was about this tall, <laughs> to state clearly and firmly what we need is a women's bank. And another participant shouted out, yes, a World Bank for women. We never once doubted that the source of credit, that source, could happen. Today, WWB, a loan guarantee organization, has affiliates in 15 African countries and nearly a million clients worldwide. Momentum for women's advancement had been building in Africa well before the Mexico Conference. Africa had the only region-wide UN program for women in the world. My appointment in 71 and a grant from Sweden had been helped to, the purpose was to help develop this program. So our small delegation from ECA that went to Mexico represented the newly created African Training and Research Center for Women, ATRCW, whose mandate was to find ways to implement the resolutions taken by eight UN-sponsored meetings of African women before that time. Creating a women's center within the United Nations bureaucracy, ECA, was challenging. I can tell you lots of stories, but I'll resist. But with, with the support of 19 external donors, including NGOs and UN organizations, we prevailed against attacks and launched a series of programs that responded for the first time to what thousands of African women wanted from the UN. Training courses, appropriate technologies, government commissions and bureaus on women, national bibliographies, and more. 
And I must note that the ATRCW staff person who produced 115 publications in six languages for ATRCW is with us here, Nancy Hafkin. <laughs> Having, having assured the security of AT, ATICW, I left after five, seven years. I left a thriving program in the hands of Mary Tedesse and arrived at UN headquarters in New York to find a very tiny office that had room enough for one desk and two chairs so I could have a visitor. <laughs> its window had a very clear view of the brick wall of the U.S. mission to the United Nations. <laughs> I dreamed of Addis Ababa. <laughs> My responsibility, however, was to lead the creation of a U.N. fund for women that would respond to all developing regions. I was there because, despite the different policy positions at Mexico City, everyone had agreed that a year was not enough for women. We needed a decade, and we got 1976 to 1985, to begin to activate the World Program Plan of Action that had emerged from the conference. And we needed a global fund to assist low-income countries to implement the plan. Initially called the Voluntary Fund for the UN Decade for Women, it would be renamed UNIFEM at the end of the decade and has now morphed again, and it's called UN Women. The UN resolution creating uniforms, UNIFEM suspe yeah, sorry, specified that it was to give special consideration to rural and poor urban women to programs in the least developed countries, and to innovative and experimental activities. Since our office consisted of one professional, one secretary, and an accountant, I needed help. So the first action we took was to appoint senior women's program office selected by the UN Regional Commissions in Latin America, the Caribbean, and in Asia, and to persuade what is called Western Asia, the Middle East, to use their own posts for these two people. One of the Latin American officers told me later, we never would have had a women's program without UNIFEM. Women had both used and changed the UN system Again, with the help of these officers, we sponsored training women as labor leaders in Peru and ensuring women controlled their silk production proceeds in India. We introduced fuel-saving technologies during the prolonged drought in the Sahel, and much more. This support of women's economic and political activities was truly innovative in the 1980s and often revolutionary. One such innovative activity was Kenya's Green Belt Movement, <clears throat> led by Professor Wangari Maathai, who many of us know. As I noted to this caucus a decade ago, it met the resistance of UNIFEM beneficiaries often faced when the wonderfully charismatic Wangari requested support for village women tree planters from her government's foresters, they replied, you need a professional to plant trees. You need a diploma to plant trees. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> At UNIFEM in New York, we got a similar response from the UN forester reviewing the project who advised us, don't support it. Those experts seemed not to know that women planted most of, if not all, of the family food. And fortunately, our UNIFEM committee agreed with us and not with the foresters. So the Green Belt got $120,000, and they spread over five years to build their movement. As you know, Wangari received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003 for her, I quote, 
holistic approach to development that embraces democracy, human rights, and women's rights in particular. She believed there was a deeper cultural reason for the foresters uh, uh, having rejected the idea of women planting trees, namely that the Green Belt movement appeared threatening to the status quo because it was organizing ordinary people, poor people, and empowering them telling them that they can cause positive change to their environment and they can do it on their own. So the Unifem Greenbelt Partnership evidences how women changed the UN and the UN, in this case Unifem, changed women's lives. I'm pleased to say I'm still a member of the Greenbelt Movement Board and of the Sir Leaf Market Women Fund Board of Liberia. In summary, when the end of the decade for women, 1976-85, was celebrated at the Third World Conference in Nairobi, women had moved dramatically at national and global levels to create both UN and civil society organizations, institutions that would ensure the long life of our global movement. We had networks, yes but institutions would give greater unity and permanence. Besides ATRCW, UNIFEM, WWB, there were INSTRA, the Women's Tribune Center, CEDAW, and of course, our own Women's Caucus of the ASA, among many others. The women's movement had gone global as women moved beyond a narrow definition of women's issues to advance women's perspectives on a range of global issues within the global conferences of the 90s. Those conferences included, as we remember, environment, human rights, population, poverty, employment, trade. Uh, and all of them experienced women's presence. The UN had made this transformation possible. It can indeed be called the unlikely godmother of the global women's movement, as I call it, having opened its doors for women to discuss critical issues as well as inserting their own concerns. I admit that sometimes we had to batter down those doors, but the UN still opened them. Tripart our coalitions of government, UN and NGO representatives had proven effective. We joined with others. Over the four decisive decades since 1975, we have also seen profound growth in African academia and in research. Some of the advances that I'm aware of that I would just mention, women's and gender studies programs, department, and schools, as I understand McCary University now has a school of gender and women have multiplied at African universities, and I hope someone here can tell us how many there are. Of special note, synergy between research and activism keeps researchers in Africa closer to realities and their influences of class, race, and other factors on gender issues. As Achola Pala recently explained, in Kenya, activists and scholars develop close relationships at universities. In addition, many African women teach and do research in their own and in American and other overseas universities. You're here, a lot of you. Thanks to Claire Robinson and the late Marion Doro and others for making those awards happen. Yes, don't think I'm a total optimist. We, there has been backsliding, including a decrease in funding women's NGOs. This is due at least in part to emphasis on mainstreaming that brought about diminished returns for women on the ground. The absorption of UNIFEM into UN women also nearly eliminated UNIFEM's funding function. So we come to our third and final question. Where do we see the global women's movement going and where do we want it to go? What are our thoughts on desirable directions and queries that are relevant to the intellectual work 
of our caucus. Here, quickly, are four of mine. You will have many more or different ones. My first one is about power structures. Do we have an holistic vision of our goals and strategies? What further knowledge do we need as a basis to change the deeply embedded gender power structures that force women in all their diversity to bury the heaviest burden of poverty and inequality? To what extent should we depend on or qualify partnerships with the private sector whose goals and strategies are often out of sync with those of women and other groups seeking social and economic justice. My second direction is priorities. <clears throat> Until 1994, there was a major emphasis on women's poverty and programs aimed at economic empowerment to lift them and their families out of poverty. With the Vienna Conference, emphasis shifted firmly to women's rights or human rights. And in recent years, great progress has been made in building awareness of the extent of violence, trafficking, FGM, and other forms of violence against women worldwide. But I'm sure you agree that we must never be content to see women only as victims. Nor should we allow the dramatic suffering of some few women and girls play into the hands of terrorists so that we ignore the sufferings and deaths of multitudes of women and men and children, as a panel yesterday discussed. Can we intensify our efforts to help women move from victim to leader? To ensure that a, what I call a bosser balance is maintained and that women are not neglected in the current environment of economic globalization. My third future direction, peace. We've had good panels on it here. Women were successful in getting the Security Council to pass Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security and subsequent resolutions. Yet, as noted in a panel yesterday, we still don't see many women at the peace tables. Further, as a colleague working with the UN's Department of Peacekeeping and UN Women advised, quote, we need to expand our knowledge and understanding of the strategies women use to reshape their communities in the aftermath of conflicts. We lack research in this area, she said. Can some research of African University women gender and gender studies and women's caucus members be designed and shared with the UN? My fourth and final future direction, role models. Africa has had innumerable outstanding women leaders. We know many of them thanks to Kathy Sheldon for her bios. Still, few detailed biographies or autobiographies are available. I think, for example, of women in the 60s and 70s, my time, Jacqueline Kizerbo of, in the Sahel, Catherine Wanamwamba in Zambia, Mrs. Justice Annie Jaggi of Ghana, Jean Martin Cisse of Guinea, and so many others. Can we identify more Estero clues in Wangari Mathai's? What splendid role models, all of them, their visions and their championing of social justice would be for the young. Those are my four for the future. So in closing, as we examine our tremendous and yes, truly revolutionary progress and women's relationship with the United Nations, there is no avoiding the fact that the UN has contributed greatly to building the women's movement. The UN and its women's conferences help make women's issues credible. The UN has been our unlikely godmother. As well, the women's movement has had strong influences on the UN and other societal institutions. The women's movement has changed everything, as someone said. Most of all today, 
we celebrate our roles as teachers and researchers and our organization, the ASA Women's Congress, that has had its ups and downs, like all organizations, but has endured and grown stronger as part of the global women's movement over four decisive decades. Members' research has changed our knowledge of history in a constantly changing world. And we celebrate our young sisters who will lead our caucus to new heights in the future. Happy birthday, Women's Caucus of ASA, and thank you.